Good day, everyone. Welcome to Gaia STEM lecture series of Taiwan Top Science Student Project. I'm today's host, Juling Shi from National Central University, Taiwan. I'm actually very nervous today because today we have a great brain surgeon, scientist, and professor here with us. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Professor Ling Da Liao, West Eugene Stern, Chair of the Department of Neurosurgery at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Professor Liao is also the Chair of Department of Neurosurgery at UCLA Health, Professor and Director of the UCLA Brain Tumor Program, former Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Neuro-Oncology, a member of Women in Neurosurgery. Professor Liao's clinical expertise is in intraoperative functional brain mapping and use of intraoperative imaging for resection of brain tumors. Her research efforts are focused on the molecular biology of brain tumors, gene therapy, immunotherapy, and brain cancer vaccine. Recognized for her expertise in complicated tumor surgery, Professor Liao attracts patients from around the world and has performed more than 2,000 brain tumor surgeries. Her research has been continuously funded by the National Institute of Health, and she has written more than 230 research articles, along with several book chapters and textbooks. In the U.S., just 6% of licensed neurosurgeons are female and Professor Liao is only the second woman in the nation, and she is the first Asian American woman to lead an academic department of neurosurgery. Professor Liao directs a clinical team of more than 60 neurosurgeons, neuroscientists, residents, fellows, and other specialists in the UCLA Department of Neurosurgery, which is one of the world's foremost centers for neurosurgical research clinical care, and education. Today, we have Professor Liao sparing her precious time to give us a talk about personalized immunotherapy for brain cancer. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Liao. Well, thank you very much, um, and thank you for that warm introduction. Um, so let me share my slides. Okay, well, thank you again for uh, inviting me to be here today. And, um, you know, uh, good, I guess, good morning. It's, it's, it's a morning over there, although it's a, uh, almost evening over here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, personalized immunotherapy for brain cancer. And this is a topic that I've been studying for ooh, um, almost 30 years now. Um, and a lot's been happening in the field. Uh, but I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the research that, that I've been doing in this area and uh, the directions that, that uh, my lab and I are going uh, with this topic. So, so as, uh, you know, as was mentioned, I am a neurosurgeon. Uh, so, uh, you know, what I do uh, on the clinical level is I perform uh, neurosurgeries for, uh, for brain tumors. But despite... Um, surgery, uh, brain cancer, unfortunately, inevitably recurs. And that's kind of the, the problem uh, with this particular uh, type of cancer. So, um, so this is a, an MRI scan of a typical brain tumor. Um, and you can see the tumors here in the left temporal area. And um, despite surgery, you know, here's, you know, what the patient's MRI scan looked like after surgery, and it actually looks quite good, the tumor is out. Uh, and then after surgery, uh, we typically do give a radiation. So despite surgery and radiation that kind of kills the, the, some more cells around the margin and then chemotherapy, unfortunately, this type of tumor comes back. It comes back within a matter of months, usually, usually by six to nine months, the tumor comes back. And, and the reason is that what we know is that there are probably uh, tumor cells uh, throughout the brain that we can't see. You know, I can't get to these surgically. We can't really kill them with radiation and chemotherapy. So um, 
you know, one thought uh, was that, well, how do you get, you know, one thought of how do you get to tumor cells that you can't see and, and you can't really uh, get to because of the blood brain barrier in terms of any drugs that we can deliver. Um, so uh, the, the, you know, kind of concept that we had many years ago was that, well, it, you know, immunotherapy uh, would be a way to get to these cells. You know, if there's a way we can harness the, the immune response to uh, track down and, and kill these tumor cells, that's a way that perhaps we could get control of these tumors. And so for many years, we've been working on a brain cancer vaccine. And uh, through many trials and tribulations, uh, th there have been different you know, formulations of this vaccine. And uh, I'll just kind of talk to you about some of the thoughts and, and uh, research we've been doing in this area. So one problem with developing a vaccine to, to brain cancer, and the most common ca uh, type of brain cancer is a tumor called glioblastoma. Uh, this type of tumor is actually, the, the original name for this tumor was glioblastoma multiforme. And the reason is because it is multiforme. It, it, it's actually very heterogeneous. So, uh, so this is a tumor that has what we call intertumoral heterogeneity. So it's different from one patient to another. And you could actually see, see this here based, oops, uh, let me go back one. Uh, based on the uh, genetic sequencing of these tumors, you know, these are, are you know, a hundred different tumor uh, uh, tissues. And you can see the genetic mutations are very different from one to, a, to another. So there's really no common uh, set of mutations. And there's, you know, each tumor has many mutations, uh, but there's really not any common domin dominant mutations from, you know, this heterogeneity. So like I said, it's different from one patient to another. And then even within a patient's tumor, there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the tumor cells. So it's not like a, you know, a leukemia or a lymphoma where there's only one type of cancer cell. This is a cancer that has many different types of cells within it. So, um, so you know, one challenge is how do you design a tumor vaccine that can attack all these different types of tumor cells? And it can't necessarily be a, a vaccine that's off the shelf because each patient is somewhat different in terms of the types of tumor cells and the types of tumor mutations. So that presents certainly a challenge in terms of designing any type of uh, of targeted treatment and, and also any type of targeted vaccine. So one of the things that we've been looking at um, in, in terms of how to do this is by leveraging a type of immune cell in the body uh, called a dendritic cell. So what a dendritic cell is, is actually uh, an, what's called an antigen presenting cell. So it's a, it's, a, it's a normal immune cell in the body. And what its function is, is that it takes up tumor antigen uh, and, uh, or, or any types of antigens, viral antigens, bacterial antigens. And the, its function is to process that within, you know, it, it's a, like I said, an antigen presenting cell. So it phagocytizes these tumor cells or tumor antigens. And then it presents it in, in the context of uh, MHC uh, in these kind of special receptors that are able to activate uh, T cells, um, either, you know, it's, and CD8 T cells are the body's killer T cells. And these are the cells that are needed to basically kill uh, bacteria, viruses, and, and tumors. So these cells, these T cells need to be activated, but they need to recognize antigen. And these antigen presenting cells, these dendritic cells, are, are the, again, the best cells to kind of activate these T cells. And, and the reason they're so good is because they actually have all these other co-receptors um, that are able to uh, elicit uh, an immune response and activate these T cells. The cell was discovered back in the 1970s by uh, Dr. Ralph Steinman, who subsequently in 2011 won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And so when, uh, you know, back in the 1990s, I actually heard a talk from Dr. Steinman about this cell. Uh, and that's, you know, got uh, got me to thinking, well, perhaps we could utilize the cell to uh, process these tumors that are very heterogeneous uh, and activate these T cells. 
Um, and in the brain, you know, the, the, the uh, concept at the time was that there, there are no dendritic cells that actually circulate routinely in the brain. There's no you know, conventional lymphatics. Um, so if there was a way that we could take this cell and put it together with the tumor tissue, perhaps we could use that as a vaccine. So as I mentioned, dendritic cells are nor that they're just normal cells in the body. They actually normally they come from the blood, uh, the, the bone marrow. Uh, so they come from bone marrow precursor cells, and they actually travel to the peripheral tissues like the skin or the gut or any place in your body where there could be foreign invaders. You know, for instance, bacteria or antigens. Um, a bacteria or ba um, viral antigens. And in this case, that, that what I'm gonna to talk to you about is the potentially you know, capturing tumor antigens. But their normal function is to capture these antigens. And once the antigens are captured, they become activated. So they start to migrate. Then they migrate either through the lymph lymph lymphatics, the lymph system or the blood to go to the secondary lymphoid organs, the lymph nodes or the spleen. And that's where they activate the T cells. And as I said, the T cells are what is needed. Activated T cells are the killer T cells that are needed to attack, for instance, tumor cells and, and, and kill them. So this is, you know, the, the, it's really a, a process whereby we're trying to activate these cells um, uh, to uh, activate these T cells. So, uh, you know, over the years, what we found is that these dendritic cells, so we could take dendritic cells from a patient's own blood, uh, culture them, and then put them outside of the body uh, in culture with tumor cells. And what we found is that these dendritic cells, in this, in, in this instance, if they're labeled in red, can actually internalize uh, the tumor cells, which are, are the, the green areas here. So, you know, in the cell cultures, we put the green cells with the red cells and the red cells were able to phagocytize the green cells. And then the function of these cells, these red cells, these dendritic cells are to process and present the antigens to the T cells. The, the, these green, the, basically they're able to process these green tumor cells in a context that can be recognized by the, uh, the T cells. So this is just a schematic that uh, kind of illustrates you know the 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 the, uh, the the concept of this vaccine so if we could take a dendritic cell that's loaded with the tumor antigen so you know you take the tumor and and the, the source of, of tumor antigen because this is such a heterogeneous tumor uh, we actually use the patient's own tumor tissue to load a patient's own dendritic cells with the antigens and these dendritic cells can then uh, you know in the lymph node, activate the T cells, whether they're the naive memory CD8 T cells or the CD4, what we call helper T cells. So the CD8 T cells are the killer T cells and the CD4 T cells are, you know, uh, simply what we call uh, the, the helper T cells. And then these T cells can then go and hunt down uh, tumor cells, cells that have the antigen that it was activated to and, uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, kill kill these tumor cells. And one thing that's actually, um, I think it's, you know, uh, interesting is that if once these T cells kill the tumor cells, sometimes these release other antigens that were not the original antigens that the T cells were activated to. And, uh, and then these dendritic cells hopefully can come and pick up these antigens and then present them again to the T cells. And I think this is very uh, important because they're, you know, these tumors, as I said, are heterogeneous. So we can never design a vaccine to cover all the antigens within a tumor cell. But if the, when the tumor cell dies, if these antigen presenting cells could come and pick up these antigens again and activate the T cells, we could actually have a perpetuated immune response. So, Again, so now we have, as I mentioned, the, the vaccine, what we call these DC dendritic cell based vaccines. And each dendritic cell can activate hundreds of anti cancer tumor cells. So, this is, for instance, a dendritic cell that was able to you know, process the tumor antigens and then load it on its cell surface and then activate a naive T cell 
So, and a resting T cell, uh, you know, is um, activated by these dendritic cells. Once they're activated, they can become an anti-cancer activated T cell. Uh, and these activated T cells can then proliferate. They actually uh, are able to divide clonally. And uh, then, so one dendritic cell can activate hundreds of these T cells to hopefully travel to the tumor site and kill the tumor cells. So this is kind of theoretically what uh, you know, happens conceptually. Um, over the years, we've done many experiments that have uh, tried to you know, prove this concept. Um, and we were the first to actually uh, discover that using this, uh, this paradigm of dendritic cells pulsed with autologous antigens, we were able to get T cells infiltrating into brain tumors. Um, this was work that, you know, uh, we did back in the 1990s. And, um, you know, right now it doesn't seem, you know, that profound because now, nowadays we, we know that we could get T cells into brain tumors uh, with, with immunotherapy. But back then there was a concept of um, immune privilege in the brain, meaning uh, many people thought that the brain was immune privileged and that immune cells actually can't get into the brain. And what we showed is that with this vaccination paradigm, we were able to get CD positive T cells into brain tumors. So that was kind of the first step in, in showing that, you know, these uh, immune cells, you know, with, with this vaccine strategy can actually get the T cells in the tumor. And it did lead to increased survival in the animal studies that we initially did. So that led to a first in human clinical trial of a dendritic cell vaccine that we started in the early 2000s. Um, and what, you know, as I mentioned, um, we uh, were able to uh, actually grow these dendritic cells outside of the body. So even though you know, these cells were discovered in the 1970s, it wasn't until the late 90s when people discovered how to you know, process and grow these cells outside of the body. And that's when it became uh, a potential therapeutic. So these taking blood monocytes, we were able to develop dendritic cells by growing them outside of the body using a certain cytokines. Uh, in, in our case, we used GMCSF and IL-4 uh, so that they became uh, cultured dendritic cells. And then these dendritic cells could be pulsed with tumor antigens. And over the years, we've, we've tried various forms of antigens and everything from acid eluted peptides from the tumor cell surfaces to tumor lysates, which are kind of just the, the, the um, um, lysated tumor tissue to actually you know, also targeted antigens. And what we found is that because of the heterogeneity of this, these tumors, taking the tumor lysate, just taking the whole tumor uh, tissue uh, and pulsing the two dendritic cells probably worked the best. At least that's what we found in, in our initial clinical trials. So our uh, initial phase one, phase two trials uh, showed some increased survival uh, in these patients that got uh, dendritic uh, cell pulsed with tumor lysate uh, and uh, we, when we uh, treated these patients. And these initial uh, trials, um, when we compared them to, you know, the, the three-year survival rate was about 47%, which um, at the time, even with uh, the best chemotherapy and radiation uh, in paradigms, the three-year survival uh, was about 20% uh, in, in, uh, in, in the, these groups. So with that, we went on to do, you know, subsequent phase three trials. Um, but during our uh, early phase trials, we also found, um, you know, the same thing that we found in the animal models that we were able to get T cells going into the patient's brain tumors after vaccination. And the uh, increased CD8 uh, T cell infiltration was actually uh, correlated with increased survival. So the more we were able to get these T cells into the tumor, the, the better the, the patients tended to do. Um, there, however, were some patients where we, even after uh, uh, vaccination, for some reason, we were not able to get the T cells into the tumor. So there were certainly some patients that were better responders and then some patients that did not respond. And there were various factors that correlated to a poor or a decreased response. Um, one of them was just, uh, for instance, having increased TGF beta, um, which is an immunosuppressive uh, cytokine, you know, tumors that tend to have increased tumor uh, TGF beta were also uh, correlated with decreased survival. 
Um, as I mentioned, uh, there were certain uh, patients that tended to respond better than others. So we actually looked at different subgroups of glioblastoma. Uh, back then, these, there were some early uh, studies that showed that there were different subgroups of these tumors. There were what was called the, the proneural uh, GBMs, which were in the yellow, and then the red uh, here were the mesenchymal glioblastoma. So in, in our, the group, early groups of patients we did, we had you know, some proneural patients, um, some classical GBMs, and some mesenchymal GBMs. Uh, now these subgroups are, are being you know, more kind of even further uh, characterized and, and defined, but this was a paper we, we published about 10, over 10 years ago. Um, and what we showed was that Interestingly, the proneural subgroup, which is you know this group here, even though these patients tended to do better overall, they they were not the ones that were uh, you know shown to to have increased survival with the vaccine. It was actually the mesenchymal subgroup. Uh, these patients, they uh, in general did worse. But in the group that got the vaccine, they were the group that actually did the best. So there must be something about this specific subgroup that tends to, you know, suggest a longer survival. And in our, our later phase trials, you know, our current phase three trial and other trials, we're, we're kind of finding the same types of uh, correlations that the mesenchymal subgroups of these glioblastomas tend to do better. Um, so we went on to a phase three multi-center randomized clinical trial. This was done in four, um, four countries around the world, uh, the US, uh, the UK, Germany, uh, Germany and Canada. Um, and uh, this is kind of the, the clinical trial of schematic. You know, patients underwent surgery uh, to get their tumor tissue. Um, after they recovered from the surgery, we did a leukophoresis, meaning we took out their white blood cells because as I mentioned, the vaccine is made from a combination of the dendritic cells, which are cultured from the patient's white blood cells, uh, put together with the tumor tissue. So we got the tumor tissue and the white blood cells. The patients then went on to standard radiation and chemidor, which is the, the chemotherapy drug. They did this for six weeks. Um, and then uh, we, we did some baseline exams and then they got the vaccine. Uh, initially three injections and then we did booster injections every two months for the first year. Um, and then every six months for the second year, and then um, and then you know uh, once uh, in the third year, and then uh, we just observed these patients, uh, and then they went back to their uh, chemotherapy drugs. Um, and we just recently, um, you know, uh, six months ago, published the uh, results of this phase three study, and it did show that we did have some increased survival uh, in in the patients who uh, got the vaccine compared to external uh, controls. Um, and, uh, and there were some you know, correlations of specifically patients that had this MGMT methylation, which is a, a marker in these tumors. These patients uh, tended to do uh, you know, significantly better. Um, in the recurrent glioblastoma, we also saw some increased survival. You know, the survival went from 7.8 months uh, to 13.2 months. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, this is a disease with a very poor survival, you know, median survival for recurrent GBM is only 17.8 months. Um, in these, in this newly diagnosed and, and in the newly diagnosed cohort it was only 16 months. Um, even though there are some increased, uh, median survival, I actually think what's more interesting is this tail end of the curve. Um, in this, you know, case, you know, over 13% had long-term survival over five years. And these patients had survival, not just um, long-term survival, but also survival without recurrence. So you can see here, you know, 25 of these patients have been living over five years now. Um, whereas in the external controls, there was, you know, we, we see very few five-year survivors. Um, so, you know, I, I think the kind of next steps is to kind of figure out, well, why are these patients living so long? How do we kind of get... Uh, figure out why certain patients respond and certain patients don't, um, and also how to improve the response rate uh, in, in using these vaccines. So I think that, you know, kind of the future of where this would go would be to combine dendritic cell vaccination with, you know, various other types of therapies. And in particular, our lab is particularly looking at checkpoint inhibitors, combining uh, dendritic cell vaccination with checkpoint inhibitors, 
uh, and uh, stimulation of co-stimulatory molecules that will um, kind of increase the efficacy of, of these vaccines. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, you know, a couple of the, both of these topics. Um, first of all, the checkpoint inhibitors. Um, you know, the most uh, I guess a common one that that's been uh, studied and 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 it, you know currently used in uh, clinical um, uh, cancer treatment is uh, is the PD one and PDL one uh, inhibitors. Uh, and these are um, so. What PD one and PDL one are? There are they are really, you know immune modulators. Uh, the PDL1 is, uh, you know, is, is a receptor on tumor cells, and the PDL1 is on the T cell. So, you know, as I mentioned, in order for a T cell to kill a tumor cell, they have to uh, recognize the antigen. So basically, the T cell receptor has to recognize the tumor antigen, and if it recognizes the tumor antigen, it will attack and kill the tumor cell. But these checkpoint uh, inhibitor, these checkpoints, the PDL and PDL1 system um, are are also receptors on the tumor cell and the T cell that actually um, downregulates the function of the T cell. So, so they're really to prevent a, an overstimulated immune response. So this is what the, these checkpoints do. They actually are, you know, um, preventing this T cell uh, activation or or, or um, killing of the tumor cell. And these molecules, these checkpoint inhibitors, whether they are the anti-PDL1 inhibitor that blocks this uh, receptor or the anti-PD1 inhibitor that blocks this receptor, what it does is it releases these checkpoint um, uh, inhibitions so that the T cell can actually continue to engage with the tumor cell and then lead to, lead to tumor cell death because it, it dis disengages this checkpoint inhibition. Um, so we uh, combine we you know with that we combine that with our dendritic cell vaccine um, and what we found was that so um, you know taking a step back you know checkpoint inhibitors these PD one inhibitors are actually now FDA approved and they're used in multiple different types of cancers however they are still not FDA approved for brain cancer because they have not you know there have been multiple clinical trials that have shown that these checkpoint inhibitors actually do not have efficacy in brain cancer. And I think the reason is because, like I said, the inhibitors inhibit this T cell tumor cell interaction. But if the brain, brain does not have any T cells in there, just giving the inhibitor actually is not efficacious. It doesn't really uh, you know, make any function. Um, so that's why, um, remember, as I mentioned, one of the first things that we found many years ago with using these uh, vaccines is that what we can do is we do get T cells getting into the tumors. But then once the T cells are in, you know, in, in the tumors, as I mentioned, one problem may be that the, tum the, the checkpoints, the PD-1, PDL one interaction actually uh, neutralizes the function of the T cells so the T cells can't, uh, can't work to kill the tumor cells. But if you don't have any T cells getting in there, just giving the checkpoint inhibitors don't really work. And this is kind of illustrates that. So what we found was that um, the, um, you know, the CD, a CD3 uh, count, the T cell count in the tumors, if you, you know, just with the, the checkpoint inhibitor alone, the, there is no, there are no T cells getting into the tumor. If we give the vaccine, we do get T cells getting into the tumor. If we give the vaccine plus the PD-1 inhibitor, we may get a, a little bit more T cells into the tumor. But what's even more interesting is the function of the T cells. So again, um, the, you know, kind of the functional activation of the T cells, the controls, you know, very in the control, there are very few T cells. Um, and also they're not, you know, uh, activated. So the cell count is low and the activation is low. If you just give the PD-1 inhibitor, you can activate these T cells, but the C cell count's low. There's very few of them actually in the tumor. So you actually are not really uh, providing a, a robust immune response. Whereas, and as I mentioned with the vaccine, what we do see is that there's increased CDL8 cells into the tumor, 
But that in itself may not be enough if, if those cells are being inhibited by these checkpoint inhibitors. So when we actually combine the vaccine and the inhibitors, you actually see both an increased cell count and increased um, activation. Um, so that's one uh, concept. Uh, the other uh, that I want to talk about is, um, you know, so, so one concept is to block the checkpoint inhibitors, the immune inhibitors. Um, the other uh, concept is to stimulate the immune stimulators. Um, so, um, you know, one, one thing that, uh, you know, we have found is that uh, sometimes we could do that by uh, activating the toll-like receptor, uh, you know, receptors on, on these, uh, in these immune uh, uh, systems. So toll-like receptors, um, for those who, who may not know, what they are, are they, they rec recognize uh, pathogen associated molecular patterns. And they actually are a very important um, molecule just within the innate immune system. So for instance, if you have a, a virus um, or, or an infected cell, uh, the double-stranded RNA or the single-stranded RNA uh, actually uh, you know, uh, can transmit these signals that activate these toll-like receptors. And what they, essentially it does is it actually creates a danger signal uh, to, to the host. So the host actually can, can sense that the, this uh, foreign invader is actually dangerous. And then that's how you know, we, we are you know, able to elicit an immune response against these, uh, uh, the, these kind of foreign uh, invaders. So um, toll-like receptors, as I mentioned, are, are danger signals that are linking uh, the innate and the and acquired immunity. Because when you have a pathogen, you know, like I said, whether it's a virus, a bacteria, or, or a tumor, what the, these antigen-presenting cells do, you know, the, like I said, the dendritic cells, is they, they can capture the antigen. But the problem with the tumor cell is oftentimes the tumor cell is what they have are what's called self antigens. They they are the reason the tumor was able to grow was because your immune system did not think of them as dangerous. They're they're actually self antigens, and the immune system does not recognize um, them as being dangerous. So even if you activate um, or you capture the uh, antigens and you're able to present them to T cells, you may need a it, like I said, a danger signal. You need to activate the TLRs, the toll-like receptors, so that your immune system actually can release these um, cytokines, these IL-12, IL-18 cytokines that actually will stimulate the T cells to say, hey, this is um, a dangerous pathogen. This isn't just self, and then activate the immune system. And, and this is, it's a very tightly regulated process because you can imagine if your immune system was attacking self, you know, you, you would have an autoimmune problem, you know, you would be, uh, you know, uh, and that's one thing we certainly don't want in the brain. If we activate an immune response against the normal brain cells, then, you know, you could have a very severe autoimmune problem. So this is actually a, you know, a system that the body has actually learned to not get, you know, activated, the immune system doesn't get, at the acquired immune system doesn't get activated to self antigens. But we actually want them to recognize the tumor antigens as non-self. So, you know, one way to do that is to stimulate the TLRs. So there are some um, compounds that actually do that. And uh, so we, we, we looked at two different compounds. One is called poly-ICLC, which is a TLR3 agonist. And then the other uh, compound we looked at was rizicamod, which is TLR7 and 8. And they, they, they just, you know, as you look at this, they, they just recognize different types of things. TLR3 uh, recognizes double-stranded DNA, and then TLR7 and 8 is single-stranded RNA. But these are just kind of the, the, the patterns that they recognize. But there are drugs that target and stimulate those receptors. So we did a clinical trial um, where we took a, a you know, three groups of patients. One group just got the vaccine alone. One group got the vaccine plus poly ICLC, and one group got the vaccine plus rizuclamide. And then um, we we actually uh, you know did the tumor surgery, like you said, made the vaccine. Patients got the three injections, and then during each of these time points before injection, we did uh, Cytoff and bulk single cell RNA sequencing on the blood before and after. 
Um, and what we found was that um, the patients who got poly ICLC, the TLR3 agonists, actually lived longer. They actually did better in terms of their survival, which was, you know, it, uh, interesting. You know, we actually didn't expect such a, a high, highly significant difference in survival with such so few patients. You know, this was a very small clinical trial, but we did see a statistically significant increase in survival. Um, and what was even more interesting is when we took, took look looked at their blood. Um, so we looked at their blood before surgery, I mean, before vaccination and after vaccination. The groups that got actually either um, TLR agonists, either the poly ICLC or the resiglomide, they had an increased uh, uh, percentage of memory T cells. And this was just, you know, so we could detect this in the blood that they had memory T cells, um, you know, against the tumor antigen. So, so this was, you know, uh, it's a, uh, and, and I think you actually are, you know, you need to have these T cells in order to actually uh, mount an immune response against these tumors. And then, you know, in prior studies, as I showed these T cells, theoretically, they, they, you know, do get into the brain. So the hope is that if we increase the T cells in the peripheral blood, they get into the brain. And th this is just some um, uh, gene sequencing da data that shows that, you know, the, 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 uh, kind of the, the, the patients that got the poly ACL, the resiclomod had an increased uh, gene signature that was very uh, indicative of, uh, you know, a pattern of interferon gamma and alpha, alpha ad activation, a uh, similar year, you know, showing that there's distinct patterns of uh, gene, you know, uh, gene expression in, in the peripheral blood um, when we give these different types of toll-like agonists. And these interference signatures. So not only did you know did the like certain uh, toll-like receptor agonists lead to increased survival. What we showed was that um, the interference, if the peripheral blood showed this increased interference signature, those patients uh, did better. They actually uh, lived longer. So this was you know kind of a you know finding that we're thinking could be a potential biomarker to suggest you know what you know which patients may actually respond to this treatment and which may not. And so that's you know we, we're currently in the midst of a clinical trial to test this. We have you know a group of patients who get the. Um, the dendritic cell vaccination and placebo, the dendritic cell vaccination plus the poly ICLC and the PD1 inhibitor. And we're looking at their peripheral blood signatures to see if we could detect who's going to uh, be uh, long term survivors with these treatments. Um, and this is just one example case um, that illustrates how, how complicated uh, this, this disease is. So, you know, so it sounds, you know, it sounded great. Like we, we did the vaccine. And then we uh, block the immune, uh, uh, you know, checkpoint, uh, it, the immune checkpoints, and then stimulated the immune stimulation so that we could, you know, hopefully uh, increase the immune response to the tumor. Um, so this is a patient uh, who actually, this was his original tumor. I did then did the surgery, and then the patient got the vaccine plus the PD-1 blockade and uh, the poly ICLC. And, um, you know, several, uh, you know, weeks later, unfortunately, you could see it looks like the tumor came back, uh, you know, this is, and it's in, in it, there was a lot of swelling, a lot of edema. And so because, you know, so this was kind of very, um, uh, you know, interesting because this was only several weeks after this. And, uh, you know, it, it's a little too quick for necessarily the tumor to come back. But I, I went and took out this um, this tu yeah, uh, tumor tissue, and then we did some analyses on, on this. So what we did was we compared this tumor, this is the original one that I took out, to this one that you know uh, basically was the tissue after the vaccination. And what was interesting is, so this was the first, you know, this was after the um, just giving the neoadjuvant PD-1, and you could see that the um, the you know the blue are the tumor cells, and then there were a few T cells. The red are the T cells, so there are already some T cells, uh, but then there are these green cells. These green cells are the kind of what we call the myeloid suppressor cells. They're actually immunosuppressive cells, so there are within the tumor immunosuppressive cells that are trying to fight the T cells. 
So you can imagine there's like this battle that's going on where you have the blue, the tumor cells, the, the pink, which are the T cells that are trying to kill the tumor cells. But then there's green cells, which are actually trying to fight back against the, the red cells. Um, after um, this, uh, you know, immunotherapy, what we found was that there are fewer T cells. So there were T cells that were being killed off by the red cells, the, the uh, I'm, I'm sorry, tumor cells. So the blue cells were the tumor cells. There was fewer tumor cells. Actually, a lot of these tumor cells turned out to be dead or dying tumor cells. The red cells were the T cells. So the T, you can see there are many more red cells now. So the T cells are in there fighting out the tumor cells. But you see this huge increase of green cells. And the green cells are actually, they're not tumor cells. They're not T cells, they're actually uh, immunosuppressive macrophages and myeloid cells. So it's almost, it's a, um, uh, it's a counter response to the activation of a, an immune response uh, in, in, these, uh, in these tumors. So as you can imagine, um, you know, the, the, our next thought was like, now what, what should we do? We need something to kill off these green cells. <laughs> So that's uh, essentially the next, uh, the design of our next trial. And these are just some animal studies that we've done leading up to this next trial using a drug that's a, what's called a CSF1 inhibitor. And the CSF1 inhibitor essentially is a drug that blocks these green cells. So now we have a combination of the vaccine uh, that gets the T cells into the tumor, the PD-1 inhibitor, that blocks the immune checkpoint. So blocks the T cells that are, uh, you know, kind of the, the T cell immunosuppression against uh, the, I'm sorry, the tumor cell immunosuppression against the T cell. But then, like I said, sometimes when that happens, this, this immune, this whole new immune population of immunosuppressor cells come in. And so now we're adding the the CSF1 inhibitor to kill off those green cells. And you can see in the animal studies, these, the combination of the three actually lead to increased survival. So, um, so in conclusion, um, I think there are ways to accelerate the translation of personalized immune therapy for cancer. You know, we still need to develop better immunocompetent animal models that, that we could test our, our therapies in that can recapitulate the, the, the tumor heterogeneity. Like I said, one of the problems is that these tumors are very heterogeneous. And then I think eventually the, you know, the, the future will come with the, you know, in order to control these tumors, we need a combination immunotherapy approach because like I said sometimes when we induce an immune response the body is actually fighting back uh, by blocking that immune response and that's where you know these green cells these immunosuppressor cells are coming in um, so it's it, you know it's, it's a very complex uh, interplay of what what's going on you know in, in you know in the human uh, uh, brain uh, in, in the immune system. And then, you know, where, where, where our lab and others, you know, are, are looking to look for better, you know, developing biomarkers, either tumor biomarkers or blood biomarkers or, or, or cerebral spinal fluid biomarkers, like I showed you with the interferon gamma biomarker, where we can hopefully give a treatment, take the patient's blood, and then determine whether the patient's going to respond or not. If the patient's not going to respond, then, you know, that patient can hopefully move on to a different type of treatment. And then imaging biomarkers, I didn't really talk about that much, but there are MRI and PET scans that we could do to better look at these tumors. So I just wanted to end by thanking, you know, all my collaborators and colleagues at UCLA uh, in neurosurgery and neuro-oncology, radiology, pathology, pharmacology. You know, we have a very large group of uh, people that study, uh, you know, brain tumors. Uh, we have a, you know, what's called a brain tumor spore, which is a, uh, you know, uh, National Cancer Institute designated Center of Research Excellence. Uh, there's only six of them in the United States, and we actually uh, at UCLA are one of the sites. And um, I just wanted to thank you for your uh, your time and your attention, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Liao, for leading us to explore our brain. And the whole thing that you presented looks like a Star Wars movie when the pink cells are fighting with the blue and green. Uh, now I'd like to open up the floor for questions and discussions. Our audience can use the raise hand function to talk to our speaker today. 
or write down your question in the chat box and we, we can relay your questions to Professor Liao. While our audience are preparing for questions, may I ask, um, what is the most asked question of your patients? Oh, uh, <laughs> well, I think for patients, you know, and, and I think that's the, 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 the wonderful thing about being both a doctor and a scientist, because, you know, for patients, they just want it. They just want to live longer. Um, so they, you know, they don't care what's working because for us as a scientist, we want to know we want to give this drug and then see the effect and say, and then see, give another drug and then test it. Um, they're not as concerned with, with, you know, what drug's working. They just want, you know, you know, want, want it to work. Um, so, uh, so that's why, you know, you know, in the past we used to only do like one drug at a time. Um, because if you do combination treatments, sometimes you don't know which one's working, right? You don't know if it's this drug or that drug in, in the combination. But I think in, you know, in terms of immunotherapy, as I showed you, I, I think we do need to use combinations because the mechanism of action is so different. But to a patient, they don't actually care about the mechanism of action. They just, I, I think the most common question is, you know, how, how can I, you know, how can I live longer? And, and, you know, and also, maintain my quality of life because I think quality of life is very important and that's the um and and that's the nice thing about you know the, the these vaccine approaches is that the toxicity is actually pretty low compared to radiation and chemotherapy um but it doesn't work in everybody you know as I mentioned you know there's you know that the 25 patients that are living you know over five years you know it's 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 only about you know 13 to 20 percent um so if we could somehow extend that to a greater number of patients, I think that would be very useful. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a couple of audience ha having questions. Uh, Lin Qi Hong, can, uh, do you want to go ahead? Mm, yeah. Okay, so thanks for your great talk, Professor. So my question, I have two questions. Is the first one, so you mentioned that when the tumor is so dead and then release the massive antigen can identify by immune system. So uh, my question is uh, because some of the antigen of the tumor, so this is a vital, but most of them is uh, non-important. So which means even the immune system produce antibody to target those antigen, but it doesn't matter for uh, this uh, tumor cell. And some of the antigen is uh, hiding in the cytoplasma, so in antibody cannot target it too. So my question is uh, uh, how the immune system to identify is this antigen a vital or is then unimportant, or the immune system, they will try to produce antibody for every antigen. Um, so this is my first question, thank you. Well, good, um, thank you. So, you know, I didn't really talk about the B cell responses very much, and then B cells are what produces the antibodies. So there's, you know, there's actually two, um, you know, two, two uh, I guess, uh, types of immune responses. One is called the hum humoral immune response, and those are the, the, the B cells producing antibodies. The other is the cellular or immune response, and that's the T cells. And, and they, the T cells don't produce antibodies. They, they themselves, the, the cytotoxic T cells, are what goes out and kills the tumor. Um, so, uh, so I guess the in terms of, uh, so, so the, the, the vaccine concept I was talking about was really kind of more, it wasn't really to produce antibodies, although you can, you know, when you act to activate an immune signal, your body can produce B cells to produce antibodies, but it's really um, to activate the T cells to recognize antigens. And, and the reason, and, and that actually, you know, kind of brings, uh, you know, light to the fact what, you know, because you may ask, why do we need to use a dendritic cell? Because the den what a dendritic cell does is it, it phagocytizes, it eats up the tumor cell. So that way it, you could actually expose the, the antigens on the inside too. Because as you mentioned, you know, antibodies only re recognize the surface antigens. But if you, you know, using the dendritic cell, the, the, it actually will eat up the whole tumor cell, process the internal antigens as well, and then present that to a T cell. So that's, you know, the, so the dendritic cell is actually, it's, it's a fascinating cell. It's actually a cell in your own body that does this. This is, it's a cell that actually um, picks up 
tumor antigens, viral antigens, you know, all these antigens, and you know, presents them to T cells in a way that activates those T cells. So it's almost the, the, the gatekeeper to tell your immune system that, hey, this is dangerous, you need to recognize this. Um, but uh, but the, there's, there's different, as I mentioned, different types of antigens also have different, you know, if, if the body already knows that it's a self antigen, then you may need another signal to try to make it, a, you know, kind of a stronger, like, like I said, the danger signal to make the immune system recognize it. I, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so my second question is that because we know the neuron and the brain is very fragile, so they're very sensitive for any kind of the cytotoxins. They are very sensitive for any kind of the garbage and the toxic material from a, a battle between the, uh, the immune system and the tumor. So how can we handle the strength of the attack from a T cell or the other immune cell? So maybe strong enough to kill tumor cell, but also weak enough so won't harm the neuron cell. Or yes. is that uh, possible that uh, um, we can find a way to reduce this uh, damage caused by the immunotherapy for the neuron? So this is the second question. Thank you. Yeah, no, uh, excellent question. No, that's a great question. Um, so that's, the, and that's always been the challenge of immunotherapy in the brain, because, you know, you, the, um, and, and, you know, many, many years ago, people used to think the brain was immune privileged, because the brain doesn't get a lot of immune cells into it. Um, and, and the reason that is, is exactly what you said. I think if evolutionarily, our brain developed to you know, prevent an immune attack, right? Because if, if if the immune cells were always getting into the brain all the time, you know, you're you're you would always have an autoimmune response to your brain cells. So um, so I think the brain is very tightly regulated in that that case. Um, these tumors, uh, the, these gliomas in in the brain, they're actually tumors of the glial cells, not the neurons. Um, so they're you know in the brain, there's you know. There, there are neurons and, and what's called glia, which are kind of the supporting cells. So these tumors are tumors of the supporting cells. So the, the antigens are more kind of targeting what we call the white matter, not, not the gray matter. So, so in a way, you know, we could, you know, modulate kind of the attack on the neurons themselves. But even with that, like I showed you, you know, if there's too much of an immune attack, attack like, you know, the, the, if the red cells are, are killing off too many of those normal cells, then yeah, you could lead to, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, brain, I, I guess, damage uh, of the neurons. And, and that's always a problem with any therapy. It's even more prevalent, um, you know, in radiation. Uh, radiation is a treatment that we use for brain tumors, but you can imagine radiation also kills the cells in, in the area. Um, quite frankly, I think the immune system may be better because Theoretically, it should only recognize cells with that antigen, and um, and what we're finding is that at least in in, in these various um, kind of vaccines and, and immunotherapy that we're using, we don't actually um, you know get a an overwhelming immune response. We don't get autoimmunity very much, um, but um, if we do, uh, you know, there now are drugs to try to kind of reduce that. Uh, you know, drugs that reduce inflammation, like dexamethasone, we use that quite often to reduce inflammation. You could use tocilizumab, different drugs. And really, at the end of the day, it's a matter of balancing risk and benefit. Because um, like I said, glioblastomas, this type of brain cancer, the survival is only about six months. Um, and if you induce an immune response against your, um, you know, uh, brain, you could lead to a process like multiple sclerosis, you know, which is a, uh, you know, autoimmune disease, but that's actually a more indolent, you know, potentially manageable problem than dying of, of a, a brain cancer in six months. So, so sometimes, you know, we kind of have to think of what, you know, when ways to mitigate the, the overactive immune system and then you know, kind of figuring out, well, what's what's more dangerous to, to the patient, you know, um, having some autoimmunity or dying of their cancer. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Chi Hong. Uh, we have a couple of questions from in, in the chat box. 
uh, I'd like to relate it to you. Um, the question is, what's the percentage of GBM response, for example, the cold and hot tumors to the treatment that you have done? What, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? What is the, um, what is the percentage of GBM response, for example, the hot and cold uh, tumors to the treatments? Yeah, no, good, yeah, good question. So right now, I mean, when if we kind of look at our long term kind of survivors, um, I would say it's about 20 to 25%. Um, but on, you know, before treatment, uh, GBMs are, are pretty much considered a cold tumor, it actually they're very, they're not very immunogenic at all. So they're, they're really cold tumors. So so I think with immunotherapy, we're hopefully, you know, changing a cold, like a 0%, you know, uh, you know, or, or maybe I would say 5% survival, you know, because right now for glioblastoma, five-year survival is about 5%. So we're changing it from about 5% to maybe 20, 25%, um, you know, with the treatment, but it's still, you know, it's still considered, uh, you know, cold tumor. And, and I think, you know, we still need to work on, you know, if you think, yeah, 25% long-term survival is good, but there's still 75% of people that are, you know, where, where, you know, this treatment isn't of benefit. So, you know, we still need to work on ways to kind of uh, enhance the immune response. And I think one of the problems is exactly the fact that glioblastomas are cold and, and we need to ways to make these hot, you know, make, make it more immunogenic, because if they're hot, then then these checkpoint inhibitors, these other drugs that are already you know, uh, FDA approved and available would be more efficacious too. To, to follow up what you just said, um, does the age of the patient matter? Do you, do you see uh, younger patients or older patients who respond better? Yeah, good question. Um, yes, so uh, so it does matter. Yeah, and it's like two. It, it's twofold. One is the younger patients. Uh, you know, they just have a better immune system. You know, because you know you can imagine their immune cells are, are healthier. You know, they just have a more robust immune system. So so in the younger patients, I think we're able to basically uh, induce a better immune response. So so in a way, um, they you know they they do tend to do better, but. Um, like I mentioned, you know, when, when I talked about the different subgroups of glioblastomas that tend to, you actually show a better differential response with the vaccine. The mesenchymal subgroup is actually a subgroup that's typically in the older patients. Um, and, and so, so, you know, so we were like, well, why would this be, you know, why, why would we see a better differential response in the older patients? And it could be that that tumor um, that that subgroup of tumor is actually um, more immunogenic um, because in the older patients, those tumors may actually have um, a, a greater mutational burden, meaning there's more mutations. So the immune system actually, if, if a tumor is more mutated, the immune system actually can recognize it better. <laughs> so that could actually explain, you know, why perhaps so, so even though a, a younger patient has a more robust immune system, better immune cells, the older patient's tumor may actually be more mutated and be able, you know, the, the, be a more recognizable uh, by by the immune system because because um, it may be more immunogenic and and even taking that a step further, um, you know, what we think is that in, in the in older patients, that group of tumors may actually be you know, come to be because your immune system has broken down, right? So you're, because in a young patient, a young patient who has this tumor, we think that perhaps it's a, you know, a, a, a problem with the tumor metabolism or some, you know, th there's, there's probably a different mechanism that causes the tumor in a young patient. Whereas in an old patient, it could be just, um, you know, there's this theory that you have tumor cells in your body all the time, but your immune system is getting rid of them. And perhaps as you get older, your immune system just can't get rid of the tumors anymore. And so those are tumors that have arise because of a, you know, kind of failure of the immune, you know, response, but they do tend to be immunogenic. Um, so I know that's a long answer to your question, but it's, it's actually a very fascinating kind of dichotomy. Yes, many factors to consider. We have another question in the chat box. Uh, any 
idea of how the CD206 plus cells are arising in GBM? Yeah, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I actually don't don't really know. Um, I think there are different hypotheses, um, but I don't really know. I mean, there's even some uh, early suggestions that it gets, because, you know, within the GBM, there's the tumor cells, and the tumor cells are talking to the immune cells. But what we're also learning is that the neurons are talking to the tumor cells and the immune cells, because unlike anywhere else in the body, the brain also has crosstalk from with, you know, you know, brain cells, you know, other places in the body don't have that, you know, neuronal component, uh, which, which I think um, is fascinating. And I think um, there's now some thought that perhaps there's fluid, yeah, it's not necessarily these, you know, cells coming from somewhere else, maybe it's the cells interconverting you know, like a tumor cell to, you know, these various types of immune populations. But I, I don't really have a good answer to, to how they're arising. Okay. Um, thank you, Professor Liao. There are, I think there are many factors, variables, various responses due to individual conditions that affects the immunotherapy to work. And there are still a long way to go to find answers. And of, I, I think we should encourage uh, the young people that in our audience today to join your team, to join this area of finding better solutions day after day, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, no, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, glioblastoma and pancreatic cancers are probably just, you know, the two cancers that still don't have a cure. Uh, so, yeah, so I, you know, it'd be wonderful for, you know, the, the young people now to hopefully someday find a cure to glioblastoma. That's what I had hoped to do 30 years ago, and I still have it. <laughs> so hopefully the next generation will be able to do that. Mm -hmm. That's a human task. <laughs> of the whole human being. Thank mm -hmm. you, Professor Liao, for the very deep and meaningful talk. And we have a very dynamic interaction with our audience today. Uh, there are still a lot to talk about, and we hope we have more time to explore more on this topic. Due to time constraint, we shall end today's session, and I hope we can soon have another talk with Professor Liao. Uh, thank you again, Professor Liao, for sharing with us today. Thank you for participating in our event today. And thank you, Professor Leo again. And I'd like to see you next month. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.